We're very happy to take our time. That's Both really, we're purists as well. You know, we like to get the job done properly. You know, uh, perfectionists. I think we are. You know, we can't put something out which is half decent. We have to do it all hundred percent. You've got Steve Hall at Junior Boys Home occasionally pointing to the clock, going, "It's 2012, lads. The second single hasn't come out yet." But uh, apart from that, we're pretty much given free reign to to make the record that we want to make in the time that we want to make it. Oh dear. Oh crikey. Oh, Should dear. we use that word eclectic? No. What kind of records are we listening to? Well, I was listening to a bit of jazzy stuff, sort of old disco, like chic. And I like to listen to old sort of stuff because of where I'm DJing all the time. When I get home, I don't really want to listen to a lot of, you know, dance floor music. I'd rather listen to a bit more sort of chilled out stuff, you know, some old stuff. I usually get a lot more sort of old stuff. I buy a lot more old stuff, you know, like a lot of old funk and stuff like that. Very groovy stuff, you know. Um, yeah. What tends to happen to me is is during interviews, people will, will recommend records. So I've got, I'll have a list of all this music in the back of my book and I'll just trawl through record shops. I'm addicted to buying records. I can't walk past any record shop without going in and buying records. And so uh, I tend to have this stack of CDs just waiting on my desk at home and I'll, I'll just be popping them in while I'm doing, doing work and changing them all the time. So it can be anything, really, as, as Darren says, jazz, funk, whatever, but... Um, classical I listen to a lot of classical stuff I try and find trying a lot of spoken word stuff too I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn as much as I can about what is available in terms of spoken word which, which isn't a lot and of that not much of it is very good uh, because I think sometime somewhere in the future we'll uh, we'll be releasing some of that Buku fish woof 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 no, no basically um, it, it was a recording what we had um, which was sitting on the shelf it's been sitting there for about nine years now. And it was a friend called Phil, Rick's friend, um, who lives in Louisiana. And basically, ages ago, he took Rick fishing down in Louisiana. And um, basically, we've put this talking on Jumbo. And it's got him saying, when they went fishing, Buckle Fish and Gravenberg. It's when they went fishing. And basically, Cajuns sort of have a bit of French in their lingo. And so, um, and so yeah, we put that on Jumbo. And we was really struggling with a title. Um, you know, we was trying too hard and we needed it yesterday. And so basically we just had to sort of uh, have a listen to the album and Buku Fish sort of come up and it made sense to use that really. Our titles to cut a story to, short. <laughs> our titles tend to come out of nowhere. Yeah. They, they come out of the sort of least obvious places. And, and the problem was for us was that because of the last two titles, people were coming up to us and going, oh, you're going to have to come up with something really amazing this time because you've got a reputation for blah, 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 whatever rubbish they waffled on about. And it was it made it even worse, really, because every kind of head game that we played to look for a, a title... We were just trying too hard, weren't we? Yeah, We were, we were digging too deep and there was nothing there, you know. We had like you know we had to do the album. We were just finishing that off. We weren't really thinking for the title, you know. So when that fell out, it was like, yeah, OK, fine, move on. That's yeah. it, done. Thank you. It was easy as well, wasn't it? Nah, we didn't know what we were going to do. We just followed our noses, really. Mm. That was the main thing, was just to sort of get on, write an album, and uh, we didn't have nothing planned. We just sort of got in our studios, got together and just carried on writing. And, Mona, uh, uh, Mona itself wasn't even a contender for the album because it's not something that we we kind of feel that inclined to do is include something that's already been released between the albums. That's why Born Slippy was never on the record, was never on, on uh, Second Toughest. But um, it just felt right that way, right at the last minute, even the night before the cut, it wasn't the record wasn't sounding like that. We, we, we worked for weeks and weeks on different running orders and different combinations of tracks, that some of which didn't make the album, some of which were beautiful, but just they didn't feel right in that combination. That was the... <laughs> the only combination that felt right to us. Well, that's why we stopped, because um, when you're in the middle of all that silly pop madness, uh, the the last thing you want to do is is get carried along with it, because it's not really it's not really our idea. It, it, I think well, a lot of people expect you to do that, you know, um, and that's not us, though, is it? We just don't want to do that. We weren't going to do another Born Slippy. You can't become somebody else's idea of what you are because as soon as you do that, you become a caricature and then it's all over. So for us, the, the main thing was to take a break and get as far away from that as possible. 
and then um, and then try and think with a clearer head. Try and try and work mm. as far away from the uh, mm. the roller coaster. <laughs> there, there was no high point. There really wasn't a high. You point. don't at the time. You don't really know what's going on anyway, because no. we was working a lot. We was uh, in different countries all the time when it was happening, and so. Uh, it was like for five minutes. Hey, that's not bad. Midweek, number one, number two. Yeah, yeah. I was quite happy about it, but um, it really was. It was five minutes. So I think we were in Belgium somewhere. <laughs> we was, yeah, and, and we somebody was. phoned up and kind of said, Norway first. No, we found it? out about the midweek okay. in Norway doing a quartz festival, and yeah. then when it got to Sunday, we heard an hour before that it was going to get into number two. The Fugees beat us. We wanted to get to number one, really. Yeah, Fuji didn't stay together very long, did they? No. They could have buggered off before they got to number one, but there you go. <laughs> but uh, that was it. The high point lasted for about five minutes, and the rest of it was was stupid. Back to work again. Ah, <laughs> uh, there were so many. There were so many. When you just you felt that you weren't you weren't yourself. You weren't doing things that were that you would have done prior to the the kind of madness. The euphoria like that carries you along, and you you get a um, a distorted sense of yourself and what and what the group is. That's when you start to, I think, become a cartoon. So it was important to to finish the year, d- do the shows that we were uh, dedicated to doing, and then um, chill get, out, get chill. away from each other. Yeah. <laughs> see you later on. I see you in three months' time, Cole. <laughs> Our thing is is that it's um, we want to do this for as long as possible. So the last thing we want to do is cane it and, and burn and, ourselves out and milk it. Yeah, that's that's not in it for us. A lot of people said, you know, you could have been huge, you could have come back and done wonderful things and and have taken this by storm and have taken that for whatever. Um, if we'd have even tried to do that, we wouldn't have even gotten as far as this next album. So for us, it's it's about making a, a long term career, and if that means selling less records if that means doing less things if that means having less money um well that's it then but it, we want this to carry on we want this to keep being fun really oh it's going to be for the best really isn't it you know all the kids now want to like get synthesizers for christmas instead of uh of you know what they used to play stages or whatever you know it's the way forward dance music has exploded you know you could you see what's going to happen anyway. So, of course, it's going to be better for us because uh, there's a lot of young kids that are into that sort of thing. I'm not complaining, you know. It'd be nice to sell a few records as well while we do this. So, yeah. you know. There's been a case of, like, leapfrogging going on for years, though, hasn't there? Uh, Guitars versus... What? Well, well, bands like Orbital and, yeah, and yeah, Leftfield yeah, and, yeah. and and William Orbit and such, you know, coming out with, with great records. And then we followed on after that and started doing things and that sort of opened it out to a lot more people. The Chemical Brothers came on and opened it out even more and, and obviously the Prodigy had been doing it for ages and then they kind of went overground and opened it out even more. So there's a, there's a leapfrogging that goes on every year that these the, the, the group of, of bands that are, are now selling records to a, a, a kind of global fan base are expanding it each time that they go out with a new record for the ne- for the others that will come with the next record so um great the thing is that um it's it, that it's it's a uh, it's always good to see somebody else in this genre doing well because you know that you're going to benefit from it <laughs> fantastic they've been really good as it goes um did you say the gigs yeah we could we done four and um what was it montreal uh, and then Chicago, then LA, then New York, and because we weren't, we didn't have an album out or nothing like that. I thought it went down pretty well, you know. They were packed out and rocking, so it was yeah, good. Yeah, we walked away quite happy. Yeah, very nice. Uh, that oh. Uh, no, breaking a country, that's, yeah, a, that's yeah. a dirty word. What, 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 what a, a break a country think, for? I think it'd be a bonus if it happens, you know, to yeah. sell a few records out yeah. there, you know, because we'll make a bit more money. Breaking, you know, breaking we, countries we'll, is old school, though, isn't it, really? We, we want to go out there and have as much fun as possible, sell as many records as possible, turn as many people on as possible, and then come home as soon as possible and <laughs> be, be <laughs> yeah, in the garden. Yeah. We're, we're not that sort of business type music biz type band and you know, I really never have been actually not you know and, and it doesn't sit very well really that's the idea the... of you know we're making a tidy living thank you very much and if we continue to do that that's very nice but as far as you know anything else goes 
trouble is when you when people talk as well about breaking countries you know it's imp- you, you, you've got to go do a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> that's not on the cards we expect all the dance bands to do that for us yeah, that's what we were saying earlier. I think right. that's for the new techno Bruce Springsteen <laughs> No, not at all. Uh, this is bizarre. I've just come from another interview where we, we talked about something similar and actually it pet- the idea of being even notorious or recognised really frightens me. It's nice to walk down the street without no one know, knowing you. Going shopping down Tesco's, which is quite nice. Yeah, so you've got your club card I've, there, I've Darren? I've got a club card in my hand, yeah. Nice. nice. And I've got a Costco one. Well. How many points have you got in the club card? I better not say this because this is sort of advertising. Yeah, yeah. Do yeah. Do I don't want to do any advertising. You better bleep that bit out, I'm sorry. Cool. There you go. Uh, uh, oh, well. They seem happier now. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> they don't moan so much. <laughs> Darren, tell me, how has parenthood changed the underworld? Uh... I think it's changed in a nice way. You don't moan so much. <laughs> <laughs> My God, we must have moaned a lot. Yeah, no, they don't really. They're lovely. Yeah. Uh, they, they seem to be very happy. Yeah, I can see why as well. It's quite focusing sometimes. You know, you, you, you kind of think, uh, you don't feel so arty, like, uh, oh, I'm going to go off and visit the world because you guys are really upsetting me this week and I don't want to wear chiffon on a Wednesday. It's it's more like, listen, I've got family here, so, uh, as about we all start work now and shut up. And, and you, start enjoying yourself. Nah. Yeah. Uh, that we we all might be different, you know. We all we all might have a different. One. My favourite one uh, Munich. was Munich. That was, I, that was a good one. I yeah. just uh, I was, that was the most wonderful thing we'd done for a good few years, actually. I don't know. We've had some good ones. Milan was good for me. Yeah, Milan. Milan was, was really good because it yeah. started off really rubbish. Not many people there, and we we had to go on. Um, and then all of a sudden, straight after the first track, it filled out and it was brilliant, you know, because mm. we thought it was going to be rubbish and then it turned out to be really, really yeah. good. You know? mm. Different gigs for different things because we, we put on a different show every night because it's it has this thing about improvising. It's it's improvised and so it should be different every night. It's 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 kind of suited to the to the event to the to the night that we're playing and to the crowd that we're playing at. So we might walk away and say tonight. We saw God and, and, and this, the, the roof came off the place. Another night might be this it was the first really good gig in a run of several bad gigs. So we were all feeling relieved. Diff- different things. Or it might be that it was in an incredibly beautiful place. The gig that Rick's referring to was in a really sweaty warehouse. that was, And it was fantastic in a really unlikely location for something to go off on. But you could equally you could play somewhere that was just really beautiful and you felt, well, oh, chilled. That's nice. No, they're, they're, <laughs> they're not. They're not as important as each other, uh, and it, they can't be. I mean, people buy our records because of our music. They don't buy our records because of the tomato videos. Um, so, however important it is to us, yeah, that's that's a different thing. Mm. So, if you're talking about how people perceive what we do, we are a, we are a group, a band, and we make music. Um, and we happen to be heavily involved with, uh, a, you know, a, a, a group of incredibly talented artists of all sorts of talents, you know, um, and that's great. But that's um, it. That's inside the band. Yeah, this is not how you know how we see it from you know how it's seen from the outside. This is for for us to draw our inspiration from or not, as may be. I mean, we think, you know, for example, uh, we use these huge screens now on uh, on stage and the show has taken on a you know, sort of new visual dimension. It's very exciting. Um, but if we had to go out tomorrow without any of it and just play music, then that would be great. And we would still strive to put on a great show. And I think if you spoke to any fan who'd seen us play, they wouldn't really care whether the... Sc- Uh, what are you likely to see? Um, Back of you, somebody's head. You'll see um, Hayden Crookshank, you know, manipulating, manipulating lighting systems quite amazingly. You'll see Tomato working with I sixty foot was. screens. Uh, doing odd blokes on stage. Outrageous things, and then wiggling their bums. Us, yeah, jamming, bums, jamming to electronic beats and rhythms and melodies and. Things and and really, you know, we're we're hoping and praying that the music that we make transports you to some other place. That's not just the smelly club that we might be stood in, you know. 
cities. The lyrics um, are in; uh, they're in, inspired by cities, uh, streets, uh, journeys, the things that people say. I write down the things that I overhear on journeys a lot, and the things that are going on around those conversations. So, what we draw from are these long lists of snippets of conversations really that are, are they're actually very specific to places and times and they are have all got autobiographical references so this the, this annoying thing that keeps coming in oh it's like William Burroughs cut ups isn't it oh David Bowie did that didn't he uh, no he, no it, it's not cut ups it's not cut ups it's um it's more uh, documentary than that Apart from Rick and Darren, Sooty and Sweet, Pinky and Perky, <laughs> um, I'd probably say... Uh, Best Brush. Very good. Steve also very like. good. Lamb Chop was fantastic, yeah. but a bit old now. Um, who's the fam- favourite show? The stuff, the stuff that I tend to watch before we go out are things like, you know, Five Minutes of The Who uh, or uh, Five Minutes of Neil Young um, or a bit of Iggy Pop or I put on a Captain Beefheart record. Um, those those things, but then you, you know you you can tend to go off you can go off down a road where everything's very mad and full on. So it really does change. It changes all the time in the in the mm. same way that we the stuff that we're listening to. Inspiration I get most of all from the other two, and that sounds really sort of sappy, but that's the honest truth. That the more that I look within the group, the often the more exciting and challenging things. I encounter, so it's all well and good sticking these things on, but that, that, that to to get a bit fired up, but in the end they can become a bit of a kind of formula, and not really to the point. Um, I think the album has bits of techno on there, but I think also it has different styles of music on there. It's not just a tech. A lot of people say we're a techno band. I think maybe because we play a bit more harder when we. Um, when we play live but I think if you listen to the album it's got loads of different sort of vibes on there f- different flavours you know so um, I don't know I think it'd be fine I think it'd fit in fine I don't know if it comes across on the album but certainly we were we were aware of the, of the changes that were going on in dance music that house music was, was making a re- having a resurgence that uh, that the music was about more about fun and uh, the things that got us into dance music in the first place uh, rather than about um, boys in bedrooms twiddling their knobs. I wasn't going to say that. I was looking for something else. Damn. Twid- twiddling ting. Damn. <laughs> I think the ones I've been playing, the main three I was playing was Push, King of Snake, Push Upstairs, sorry, King of Snake and uh, Kittens because they were a bit more sort of uh, for the dance floor. Um, and they were all really, really good. They all went down really well. I think Kittens used to go down really well. When I used to play in Dublin, I used to play that quite a lot. And they were such a good crowd. You know, it was uh, it was nice to know that you was doing something right, you know. Every sort of tra- every underworld track I was playing was going down really well and all the other tracks sounded pretty pony. <laughs> <laughs> so it was quite nice, you know, I walked away like, oh, yeah, we're doing a good job then, you know. <laughs> um... Nah, they just go mental, you know, kittens, especially in Dublin. That was like, and also in Ibiza when we played, um, we were playing Mona as well. Sven Vaf, Sven Vate, should I say, played that when we was out in Ibiza in space, and uh, the reaction there was really good as well. Also in New York when I played it out there, that was one of the uh, main reasons why I had to say to the boys we got to put Mona on the album because the response was that good, you know. So yeah, it's just nice to see. It's a good buzz, you know, top buzz. <laughs> Governor, to uh, buzz, mate. <laughs> is there a fly in here? Um, we haven't had time to do any remixes, really. We've been asked by a few people. Um, but it's, it's a shame, really, because we want to sort of do some work, but we just we ain't got the time. You know, we're off to Australia next week, and we're doing this and that, and doing loads of press, and it's just silly to put more work on a. You know, we'd kill ourselves really if we had to do any mixes. But I, th- I think um, I'm dead. Yeah, we will eventually do some. Um, the last one we was asked to do was the Manic Street Preachers. Rick's going mouldy. And uh, he stinks a bit, doesn't he? <laughs> <God>. <laughs> but, you know, I'm sure we will do once this is finished or calmed down. 
But then again, we're talking about we want to start trying to write a new album a bit quicker than the last one, you know, The Gap. So we might even start writing at the end of this year if all goes to plan. The King of Snake words were gathered in Tokyo and it was when Rick and myself and two other guys from Tomato were involved in a, uh, making an installation out there at the, at the Ginza Art Space for the Shiseido Corporation. Uh, while we were out there, I was writing a lot of words for this album and the installation, which involved a kind of glass maze on which the words were, were printed. And uh, this was one of the nights out where we bumped into a very interesting old geezer who told us about uh, the things that he'd got up to in his youth. And one of the, one of the stories that, that, that came out was uh, the, the kind of hedonistic weekends gambling with his, with his friends. Uh, it was a horrific story, but uh, I, kind of as a metaphor for, for how things can, can go horribly wrong, as Born Slippy was. Uh, that's, what, that's what was going on with the words. Oh, it got a bit heavy then, didn't it? Maybe. That's, that's maybe the truth. I think that's a, that's a long conversation uh, and, and a kind of one that might involve um, opening up a few too many cupboards. Uh, but I think that's a, that's a fairly... Um, that, that's not a bad assumption to make about the record. It's a funny thing talking about albums, you know what I mean? It's like we can all relate to, you know, where you, you go, oh, I remember when, remember when I was 15 and we did that, when you're talking with some friends who you were 15 with, you know, oh, yeah, we did that, and then when you were 20, you did that. And, 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 and somehow in retrospect, all these things become, you know, clearer. And uh, the record will take its place, you know, in time and, and mean different things to different people, you know. Um, and that's what's sort of beautiful about, um, making music, really. Mm. It's interesting that we're talking about the t title of the album, and uh, invariably the titles of things they just fall out of somewhere. Whether it's a, whether it's a phone conversation with a friend or something that was overheard, or or uh, something that somebody had, had written on a cassette box. And already I've heard very profound things said about what Boku fish means to people. It's fantastic, isn't that great? You know. Mm. Something that was just like, yeah, that's fine, that'll do. You know, has got a resonance for people because it's associated with something that they, they enjoy. That's, that's great. Uh, there was a track a couple of years ago by a band called Mosesley that was, I thought was really cool, French group. Um, they got an album coming out very soon. Um, looking forward to that. I think uh, Norman Cook, it's stuff he does, say, uh, you know, yeah, as, in, in terms of something that, you know, is, is, is like widely, widely known, not not underground, I've got this one record and it's the only one in the world. I think Norman Cook is, is brilliant. Heard that one praise you about two or three weeks ago and thought it just made me stop the car. That's because you were driving really bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a talented bugger, isn't he? I mean, person. Talented person. Gentleman. Yeah, good luck to him. Gentleman of the dance persuasion. And very nice chap too. Yeah. T ties his own shoelaces. The Manics consistently seem to write, you know, extraordinarily good songs. Um, you know, a Design for Life, I think, is m maybe the best song that's been written for 20 years, myself. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think we're in the rock arena there. Uh, maybe we should uh, head back to the dance arena. Um, oh, yeah, I guess we're getting approving nods there from the main studio. In the dance arena... Uh, what have we heard um, that is extraordinary? Um, Darren's I, got his own label. It, it's a shame Darren's not... Dee's not here at the moment, <laughs> like, and, uh, you know, he's the man, like. He's yeah. down with the kids, and, uh, you see, me, I've had me head up me bum in a studio for two years, really, and uh, the last thing I want to do when I get out of the studio is listen to more bloody dance music, you know what, I'm, you know what I mean? Like, and uh, it's the pits, that, like... So me, I listen to like classical music and uh, folk music. You know, big folk music fan. Me uh, and tuba. I like tubas, and uh, I can't think of anything. Those are things you grow I in the garden. Gorecki's Third Symphony. Very nice. Jokes aside, was very inspiring for me. But you don't want to hear that. Mahler's Fifth. Too serious for you, maybe, matey. <laughs> but Mahler, you know, you know what I'm saying, Mahler. One of them European types. Listen, Mahler buys around. He's all right by me. <laughs> no. Um, I went to a crochet club last week, but it was a bit quiet. 
I was expecting something a bit more banging. All right, landscape gardening, monthly meetings held in the local church hall. We, we went out a few nights ago, the three of us went out, and we kind of stood there in the noise and the smoke and went, Let's go home. Let's go home. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, we, we play these places, you know. This is where we go to, you know, work and that, and it's kind of different, you know, now. I mean... Uh, I can't. Uh, when was the last time I went out to a club? Probably when Darren was playing. I Darren, think. yeah. This is it's, you know it could be six months, you know. Apart from when we've been playing there, it feels really weird to be in a club and not to be making the music. You know, when you're sort of standing there. I don't drink, so it's like no point in going out and getting wasted. Um, you know, very happy at home, so I'm not going out to pick anybody up. Um, going to listen, to, going to listen to music. Yeah, yeah, I could do that. But as soon as I hear music, then I actually want to be involved in, in making yeah. it. And, and it makes me just want to go home and get in the studio yeah. or, or, or do something. Yeah. Um, so after the first 20 minutes, it's like, great, fantastic. OK, I got, I got it now. OK, yeah. I'm going to go Let's now. Go. Let's go and, and get on with it. This has been happening for like seven years, eight years now of going out and, and actually feeling like once you've been there for half an hour, especially when, you know, yeah, you know a few years ago, Darren would be playing and, and it was incredibly inspiring. And so, you know, I, you wouldn't last very long before you'd be like, oh, God, God, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, gotta do something, you know. Not my chosen way to relax these days, you know. But it's, but uh, yeah, but, you know, in the same breath, we love to play there. You know, if you ask us where we'd rather play, you know, Manchester Nymex Centre, you know, or the Zap Club in Brighton, some small, you, you know, it's going to be a small place, you know, with atmosphere, where people want to dance, mm. know how to party, you know. Wouldn't choose to be anywhere else. And on on that note, Rick, I think it's a really great way of rounding off. Hey, let's round off. Great. I'm rounded. Off? You've taken your glasses off. Does that mean that's it?